a lovely day the Lord has granted to us. Uh, I would invite you to please turn to page... Oh, it's not on? You can hear me there. Huh. It's apparently we're not operative. Hold on a second, please. Well, I have that on. No, should have battery. There we go. Okay, now we're working. All right, let's, let's start all over again. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you turn with me to page five, just want to bring to your attention, you will see this coming Friday is uh, Bread and Bowl. It is our turn to host. So if um, that is something you would be willing to do, like to do to get yourselves involved, uh, there is sign-up sheet on the uh, board outside of the sanctuary. Uh, it is a, a wonderful ministry that about 40 people or more tend to be part of and involved in. Uh, yesterday was our um, Kids Against Hunger rice kits, and we had, we had more people helping this year than last year. We had three lines. It was a great time. It was a lot of fun, a lot of laughter, and uh, so it was just a, a good, good experience. If you've not done that before, hopefully next year you'll get involved because it was quite the successful time. On the back of your bulletin, final note that I want to bring to your attention, that is we will be doing Trunk or Treat again, and that is going to be the last Saturday of October, 4 to 6. If you would like to uh, have your vehicle in there, we had 12 cars or 12 vehicles last year. Our goal this year is 15. I'm not sure if we've ever reached 15, but that is our target of what we would like to do. We're also doing something different this year. Instead of the usual handing out of cards, we're going to hand out uh, magnets that have uh, basic contact information of the church. And with the magnets, you can use that for, for anything and put it on the fridge, and the hope would be Families will take those magnets home, put them on a fridge or bathroom somewhere, and maybe, who knows, weeks or months down the road, they may look at that magnet and go, yeah, we, we ought to try and check out that place. So that's going to uh, be a new feature. Uh, starting the first Sunday in October, which I believe is the 6th, is when we will be having a display in here. If you want to bring your candy in to uh, help out and supply the efforts, that would be greatly appreciated. That's always, though, a lot of fun, lots of fun. All right, so, um, prelude, am I correct? So we are now going to enter into our second prelude. My shepherd will supply my need. Let us prepare our hearts to worship our God and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Remain seated, but we turn together to page 94 in the front of our hymnals for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Worship affords us the opportunity to express our allegiance to our first love, the Lord our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us kneel together and confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We have good news to celebrate for the greatness of our God, that God who is rich in mercy loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Please stand. glorify our God and give our thanks and praise to him as we reclaim the Lord as the very center of who we are and all that we do. Hymn 641, all are welcome.
Together as God's people, we turn to page 98 in the front of our hymnals. Page 98, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition. We may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. It is now time for Noah's Park Children's Church.
Good morning. Before reading from the Bible, we seek the illumination of the Holy Spirit that we become receptive to the life-giving word which comes to us through both the reading and the proclamation of Scripture. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the Scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The first lesson is from Jeremiah, chapter 11. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Please read responsibly with me Psalm 54, found on page 2 of your bulletin. Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your might. For the insolent have risen against me, the ruthless seek my life. They do not set God before them. But surely God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. For he has delivered me from every trouble and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. The second lesson is from James, beginning with chapter 3. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The word of the Lord. Please stand. news of the Holy Gospel for you God's people as it is written in the Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Now, well, Gospel reading for today, Jesus foretells Good Friday and Easter Sunday, as well as reminds us that true greatness comes through serving. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands. And they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? Oh, but they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. 
And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Word of God, word of life. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. So grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Amen. Well, there was a customer that walked into Jean's Gourmet Grocery Store and just marveled at the proprietor's quick wit and intelligence. Tell me, Jean, what makes you so smart, he asked. Oh, fish heads, Jean replied. You eat enough of them, you will be positively brilliant. Oh, well, you sell them here, the customer asked. Yes, I most certainly do. Four dollars a piece. Well... The customer buys three, so of course, $12 is handed over. A week later, customer comes back in the store. He's a little ticked off, to say the least. He's complaining that those fish heads were disgusting and that he wasn't any smarter than he was the week before. Oh, you didn't eat enough, says Gene, the proprietor. And so the customer goes home with 20, now 20 more fish heads. And two weeks later, he comes back and he is just absolutely livid this time. Says, hey, you're selling me fish heads for $4 a piece when I just realized that I can buy an entire whole fish for $2. You're ripping me off. Well, you see, said Gene, the owner, you're smarter already. Uh, Jesus had a thing to say about this. When you look at what was going on there, said so the children of this world are wiser or more shrewd than the children of light, the children of God. You ever get tired of being taken advantage of? You're, you feel like you, you went somewhere and you were just taken for a ride. Or maybe it's something that you ordered off of the internet only to realize that it wasn't really the real thing. And in our common language for today, we will say, well, just, you know, do the map, or think it through, then follow through. Or King Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs, one of my favorite saying in Proverbs, in the 15th chapter, he says, the wise seek the counsel of many. And maybe that's why Solomon was so wise, because he sought and gathered the input of different people before he came to a conclusion and making a decision. So we're talking about wisdom today. And what is good wisdom and what is not good wisdom and how wisdom can be of great benefit to you and also then how the bad wisdom or the inferior form of wisdom can really paint us into a corner. Now every day we have a choice as to which we are going to submit ourselves to. So James, in our, our reading that Marcia shared with you just a few moments ago, it opens up with this incredible question. He goes, who is wise and knowledgeable? among you. Now, knowledge is knowing a lot of stuff. Some of you, you got a lot of knowledge. Some of you are great with like trivial pursuit, you know, things like that. But wisdom is taking that knowledge and being able to translate it into making choices and decisions that are really good ones into everyday life. So a person can be knowledgeable, but not necessarily wise. So what is it that you know? And then how can you, it's where the rubber hits the road. How do you put a set of wheels on it? That's wisdom. So that you interpret it in a way that benefits you and those around you. And so James, later in our reading, the answer of who is wise, who's knowledgeable, who's got the street smarts and really has it together, those who submit themselves to God. Those who will humble themselves, those who will submit themselves, those who surrender themselves to the Lord. This is a person with incredibly great wisdom. One way of understanding this, you look at the front of the pulpit, and on this pyramid, I don't know if all of you can see it or not, but you got a cross here, and then a stream, and then there's a deer. 
and the deer is, is drinking at the stream, but it's also an image of which they, this deer is submitting or humbling itself before God. Now, you may think, that's kind of an odd, odd thing to have in church, isn't it? Well, if you're one who likes to hunt deer, you're probably going, wow, God's a pretty cool God. David understood this so well that in Psalm 42, in the opening verses of that Psalm 42, he writes, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Mm -mm -mm. To submit yourselves to God is to thirst for God, to hunger for God, to seek God, to want to be in relationship with God, to be intimate with God, to know God. St. Augustine said it this way, you have created us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are just restless until they find rest in you. Mm. That is submitting yourselves to God. And James then, in verses 17 and 18 of our reading, he's going, and what does a life look like with a person who has submitted themselves to God, that kind of wisdom? James says it's marked by a life that is, has a touch of gentleness in word and action, is peaceable, is willing to find common ground, is merciful, is someone who is treating people equally and justly, is sincere, and is intentional in bearing the, the fruit that we see in Galatians 5 of love. You know, think of a life. This is wisdom, a life that is marked by love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is such a powerful understanding of the ways of God that, again, Solomon, the wisest man of his day, perhaps for centuries, in the last chapter of Proverbs, personified wisdom as, as like a woman. In fact, the, the word wisdom in the biblical language is sophia. So if you know someone who is named Sophia or Sophie, their name literally means wisdom. So you can really Im impress your friend if that's her name. You say, hey, wisdom, how you doing today? She go, what? Say, well, that's what the word means. See what I learned in church? Isn't that impressive? Well, maybe so, maybe not. I don't know. But Solomon personifies wisdom as a woman who as we will see in chapter 31, of noble character or valor, who brings good into the lives of other people, who is charitable, a woman of strength, of dignity, who has a sense of humor, and yes, who fears the Lord. And Solomon is saying, you want to see what wisdom looks like? Looks like that. And so Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, he says it this way in 1 Peter, the final chapter, chapter 5, about humility, about submitting, about surrendering ourselves to God, about thirsting, about seeking, about hungering for the Lord. Peter says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he will exalt you in due time. And Peter is reminding us that as we humble ourselves before God, he will lift you up. At some point in time, he will exalt you. That is his promise. That is really cool stuff. But James, in this reading as well that we had, also warns us of a wisdom that is contrary to God and that is a very different path. And what it wants us to do is submit ourselves to it. And James describes it as a wisdom that is earthly or unspiritual, even uses the word devilish. And he goes on to describe, so what kind of markers are involved in that type of life? What does that kind of life look like when we submit ourselves to that kind of wisdom, one that is contrary to God? He says two things at least. It's a life of bitter envy, where it's that green-eyed monster of resentment is aroused by someone else's success, possessions, achievements. Think of the time when you looked at another person and you just started getting green with envy because it's like, you know, well, why, why do they have that but not me? Oh yeah, that can get into some really nasty stuff. Um, 
comparison-based identity and with our social media, this is a very dangerous realm to get into if we're not careful. And then James also says, not only bitter with envy, but also a life of selfish ambition, which is self-serving, and that we're just concerned with our, our favorite person of me, myself, and I, and nothing to do with, as Jesus describes in our gospel reading for today, that true greatness, that if anyone wants to be number one, they must be very last and servant of all. One author describes it this way. He goes, who in our world really believes that the meaning of life is to be, to be found in service of others, of helping others? You know, really stop and think about it for a moment. Who really does believe that the discovery of the meaning of one's life can be found when we are helping another person? And this author goes on to say, but Jesus, and quite honestly what James is describing for us today, says that this is the path, what we're talking about, this is the path of life that the kingdom of God calls us to follow. But envy and selfish ambition can just derail us from that. Suffice it to say, ambition is a wonderful servant because ambition can just drive us to, to move forward, to achieve the things that we need to achieve and what we perhaps want to achieve and can be in alignment with God. Ambition is a wonderful servant, but my gosh, when the tail begins to wag the dog, ambition is a horrible master. Do you control it or does it control you? And James then continues. He goes, you know what the taproot is of this? Where this stuff comes from? He says it comes from cravings and it comes from coveting. Now think about cravings. Again, cravings can be good, cravings can be bad. But think of the cravings that, that you have in your life. When it's a hot, stinking, muggy day out there, and you've been out there for a while and you have a glass of water, sometimes my craving is something with salt. So it's like, don't we have uh, potato chips or, or pretzels or something like that around, but salt. Some other cravings can be like fruit, love fruit salad, chocolate, well, that's a no-brainer, right? Sugar, coffee, nicotine, these two can be cravings. Or burgers, uh, fried chicken, bread, that's one of mine, breads, love bread and pastas. But then french fries. Now, maybe there's times in which you crave french fries. Now, I am presuming it's not exactly the most healthiest thing to be eating with all the different oils and grease and everything that they're, they're cooked in, but it is something. This is a little sidebar here. I, I found this uh, over a year ago, just been waiting to use it at the right moment, and that is uh, potato marketers have this slogan, which I think is pretty cool. The most powerful friendships are forged between one person who likes crispy fries and one person who likes soft fries opposites can attract. How many of you like, I'm a crispy fry person. How many of you are crispy fries? A few, okay. Soft fries? Soft fries? Oh, all right. There we go. There we go. So what James, as a, that was a sidebar note, but James is telling us that these cravings, we're not careful, they can be a war within us. And he uses this term. You know, should I have it? Shouldn't I have it? Should I have it? Do I? Don't I? Do I? Don't I? can lead to unhealthy decisions. And then secondly, coveting is the other tap fruit that it gets into. That desire, the forbidden fruit, right? That desire of <clears throat> what belongs to another person. And you're going, I want that, I need that, and I don't care. Sometimes it gets to the point of I don't care what it takes. It's not theirs, it's mine. That's coveting. And that too can lead to some disastrous results. So James is telling us that there are two types of wisdom that we can follow, that we can live our lives. There is the, the wisdom the, the, from down below, as he would say, that is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish, and then there is the wisdom or God pathway from above. And we have a choice every day. Which one are we going to hunger for, thirst for, pursue, seek, submit, surrender to? Is it going to be that of God or that which is opposite of God? 
So James is telling us that if you've had enough with the cravings and coveting, the war within you dictating your life, and if you're getting exhausted with bitter envy and selfish ambition and the internal chaos and conflict and anarchy that can take place within oneself, it's like being, being like a, a rocking chair that gives you a lot to do, but it gets you nowhere. And if you're thinking there's got to be more the, to life than that, then James is telling us and reminding you and I, there is a better way. Submit, surrender, humble yourself before the Lord. Focus, or spend more time with God. About 10 years ago, there was a, a study by Daniel Gilbert and Matthew Killingsworth about what, what, how do we use our, our, our thinking, our mind, throughout our waking hours. And in, in uh, working with over 2,200 people, it was kind of a disturbing discovery that they came up with, that uh, most people, about 46.9% of our waking hours we are just mentally checked out. We aren't really in tune with what's going on around us or even the task at hand. And so one of the things they also discover with this is that most of this activity does not make us feel happy. Now, if this is true, if this is really representative of most people and accurate, what they are saying is that almost half of our mental functioning time in our waking hours is thinking about stuff that makes us unhappy. If, if, if that is indeed the case, then I think James, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is really on to something that maybe, just maybe, the smart thing to do is to begin to focus on like God's sightings, of like where is God getting my attention? And how is it that God is wanting me to, to focus a little bit more on him each day? Because if close to half of my waking hours and how I'm using my, my uh, thinking is on stuff that really doesn't matter much and can create unhappiness, then maybe that time could be better used on focusing on our Lord. You see, that, that, and, and I get it, this word submitting can really um, be put offish. And so I think if we realize that submitting is not about giving up, but it's about giving over. When we submit ourselves to God, we're saying again that we are thirsting for God, we're hungering for God, we are realizing, kind of like the first three steps of AA, I can't do it, but God can, so let him. And that is a huge step when people begin to realize that on my own, I, I just can't make the grade, and I can't pull this off. But then God, who lives and resides within us through his Holy Spirit, we have that power to turn it over to the Lord and to be actively involved with this and allow him, allow him to begin to help us in the life that he calls us truly to live. Solomon put it this way as we close out for today. Solomon, who wrote this incredible book called Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, so if you think the Old Testament is just dusty and dry and boring and yada yada and all that kind of stuff, you know, you just kind of, boy, that's a real snoozer. And if there's one book that I really encourage you to read in the Old Testament, it's Ecclesiastes. Again, written by Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest man of his day and perhaps centuries before and after. And he has this statement. Throughout Ecclesiastes, he's saying, you know, you're trying to make sense of life and, and you are trying to build for yourself this incredible life, a very fulfilling life, a great life. And I'm here to tell you, says Solomon, I've tried all the different things that are under the sun. I've tried money, sex, power, prestige, possessions, popularity, 
everything. And if you think that's going to do the trick, I'm here to tell you, it won't. But one thing I've discovered through the wisdom that God has given me, says Solomon, is this. What life comes down to ultimately that is fulfilling and meaningful and purposeful and that can get you out of bed each and every day is this. To submit yourself before God, hunger for God, thirst for God, to fear, awe, wonder, respect of God. When's the last time? Let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, really. When is the last time that you and I have just had those moments of fear of God, just absolute wonder, absolute awe, absolute inspiration of who this God really, truly is? To where at nighttime you're looking at the galaxy, the stars, and you're thinking, this God is indeed wonderful and counselor and mighty and father of eternity and prince of peace that this god even the wind and the waves obey him that this god put it all on the line for us through the life death and resurrection of our lord jesus christ to be in absolute awe and wonderment of that with autumn just around the corner and how the tapestry of colors are going to be on all the trees to just stop even for half a minute and to take it all in and the beauty of creation and to be in absolute awe and wonderment and reverence and respect which is what fear of god means and in that we then to delight in his will and walk in his ways in other words to obey his commandments and solomon is saying of all the stuff that you think is gonna make your life really happen. And some of it, yeah, temporarily, but he's saying if you're looking for something that has lasting power, because life is a marathon, not a sprint, here it is. Because this is what it means to be human. So as we close out for today, I got a t-shirt, and boy, I ordered it weeks ago. It took forever to get here. But I ordered a t-shirt for you, because I think this is really a great way to summarize and to conclude what is being said here by James on the type of wisdom that our Lord wishes us to pursue and what it is to submit ourselves before God. Now, I'm wearing it, so in order for you to see it, I need to, to take off my alb, and my stool. Uh, Rex, I'm going to need the, the pulpit mic then for this as well. All right. I think most of you, some of you may not like this t-shirt at all, and I totally get it. But some of you, probably most of you, will really, really have a, a great appreciation for this t-shirt and what it represents and what it means. So here we go. Because this speaks to me and what I've been trying to say for a long time. And I hope it can speak to you as well. So what it is, it is a cross. And it has uh, on this side pictures of um, the Ohio, uh, Ryan Day, who is the Ohio State football coach. Pictures of a number of the football players. And on the left of the cross, it says, all I need today is a little bit of Buckeyes and a whole lot of Jesus. This is an awesome shirt. Now, whether you like the Buckeyes or not, you know, you can, you can put into here, <laughs> you can fill it in and say, all I need today is a little bit of family and a whole lot of Jesus or whatever. But I've been telling you for years, the Bucks can, or the Wolverines, or whatever your team is, and all that, they can be your second, third, or fourth religion, but Christ is always, always our first love. And so this shirt speaks of everything that we've been saying today. That when we submit ourselves to God, when we humble ourselves before God, when we pursue God, when we seek God, when we love God, fear Him, awe, wonder, reverence, trust, respect, 
when we thirst for the Lord, that is all another way. Surrendering to God is another way of saying submitting. That our first love is kept first. And that everything else falls into place after that. All I need today is a little bit of fill in the blank, but a whole lot of Jesus. That is submitting ourselves to the Lord. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hymn 712, Lord, whose love and humble service, please stand. With the whole church, let us proclaim our ancient future faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and for all of God's creation. Lord Jesus, shepherd and guardian of our souls, the resurrection and the life, teach us to number our days aright, that indeed we may gain a heart of wisdom, to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you have given to bless your church and build your kingdom on earth. Strengthen our faith, keep us in your severe mercy, and give us courage to share your good news. Lord, in your mercy. We pray on behalf of Floyd Tyus, Marlene Friend, Donna Goodwin, for the family and friends of Phil Keating. We pray, Lord, for peace in the Holy Land throughout your creation, as we pray for the leaders and people of this country. We lift up to you and pray for families and marriages that are struggling, and we give you thanks and to you alone the glory with yesterday's Rice Kid Assembly, as those meals are sent locally, nationally, and globally. Lord, in your mercy, Abba, Father God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we are grateful for your amazing creation, for the seed, the soil, the water, the seasons of the year, and the cycle of nature. But we could also use a little bit of rain. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusted in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share God's peace with those around us. God's peace.
Please stand. We turn to page 112 in the front of our hymnals. Let us pray together the perfect prayer which our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Offering boxes are at both exits. As we continue to support the ministry of your congregation, our congregation, locally, nationally, and globally, to make a difference in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So for the week to come, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we are sent out into God's creation to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Let us rejoice in the Lord as we conclude our worship today. Hymn 389, 389, Christ is alive. Let Christians sing. Oh. 